Oh, so iconic. Well, hey, everyone, if you're still gathering in, I just want to take a few moments just to introduce myself. Uh, you're probably looking up here, you're thinking, you're picturing Thomas, equally as good-looking, slightly taller. Um, but I'm actually on staff here at Hope City Church. Uh, my name is Ruben. I get to see our youth department, so I hang out with our 12 to 18-year-olds. Um, it's, it's, it's the best. I walk into work, showered, smelling like a nice Irish spring. I leave, uh, smell like Domino's and something pumpkin spice. This is, this is just my life, and it's the best thing ever. Um, if you if you missed um, if you missed last week, we're in a series called "Of Kings and Prophets and Prostitutes," and it's um, basically a collection of talks under an umbrella which conveys kind of like a, a simple truth. And the simple truth this month is that the most overlooked part of the Christmas story can still have some implications for us still today. So what's the most overlooked uh, part of the Christmas story that we, we can all agree is probably the genealogy. Uh, the genealogy that leads up to Jesus is this list of names um, that if you were to try and like uh, say them out loud in a public place, like someone would think you're having a stroke. They're so hard to name. Uh, but but this, this is a list of names. And uh, these names have uh, stories, um, stories that have made a dent, big or small, in the, the coming actions that led to the birth of Jesus. Now, if you're brand new with us, I'm so pumped you're here. Um, please come back to uh, listen our lead pastor, Thomas. He ditched us for a few weeks for Australia, um, but he's back in a few weeks. Um, but if you're here, um, December's a special month for us. It's a story of thousands of years of apparent prophecies kind of coming to action, uh, all leading up to the Christmas story, which is uh, this baby boy being born um, apparently is going to change the course of humanity. Like, it's, it's crazy stuff, right? You, you can't make the stuff up. Like, this is all in the Bible. And uh, by the way, side note, the Bible is just like this insane book. When you break it open and start reading it, like, you can't help but be entertained. Like, a couple of weeks ago, I had a student of mine came up to me and was like, Pastor Ruben, the Bible still boring. I'm like, no child, you're boring. And, and, and you look through these stories and they're like, oh my gosh, like there's war and gore stories that puts gladiator to shame. There's like days of our lives, can't even touch these soap operas. And you know, you, you think Shrek is funny and clever, but God beat it to the punch. Like there's a story of a talking donkey in the Bible. Did you know that? It's ridiculous. It's, uh, can you imagine if they made movies, actual movies that represented the books of the Bible? Like, just imagine the trailer for Hosea. He was a man. She was a horrible person. Like, it didn't make, didn't, <laughs> didn't make, some of you caught that. Uh, they, made, they would make millions. <laughs> Maybe hundreds, but I don't know. Okay, but we are in this, in this uh, particular book in Matthew chapter 1, and there's this list of people that could seem ordinary to you and I, but if you look deeper into these names, uh, we can learn a lot more from them. So when you read the genealogy, you see names across the board. You see names that have automatic power and influence, such as kings and queens. You have names that are completely unexpected and that will surprise you like prostitutes. And then for the larger chunk, you have names kind of like right in the middle. I... Uh, I get, to, I, I get to travel quite often, and I like it. I, I like getting to my destination, but um, I don't necessarily like the traveling process. I, I don't want to hate it, but I dislike it very much. And, and sometimes, um, you know, you walk through airports, and you see people, and you, you see the soul just being sucked out of them for some reason in airports. I don't know if you've noticed that. Maybe I do. Maybe I have a very pessimistic worldview. But, um, you know, airport is like in the original Greek language, is incarceration to me. It's like, I don't know, just kidding, Bible jokes. Um, and when you go through it, um, it, it, it could suck sometimes. Now, I, I recently flew out of the country. I went to, uh, about a month ago, I went to Europe, and then all of a sudden I was kind of hit with all these nuances um, that irritate me while I travel and some stuff that just don't make sense. Um, I went to go check in my luggage and stuff like that, and the lady uh, takes my bags and weighs it all sweet, and uh, she kind of looks at my boarding pass, and it looks at me, and says, sir, you're 0.8 pounds over. I'm going to need you to take that weight out of the luggage and put into your carry-on. Sorry. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, it's 0.8 pounds over, so I'm going to take extra luggage space and put into my carry-on, which goes in the same vehicle. Like, to me, it's just, it's just, it's, it doesn't make sense. You move on, and you go through, like, the security process. And uh, I remember I got pulled over by this guy for a security check, and he was getting a little too frisky. 
uh, he's going like, whoa, bro, like, you got to buy me dinner first, you know, before you move any forward. And, and then finally I got to the plane and I, I, I started dozing off and I had this special skill that I can sleep anywhere. And so I'm kind of dozing off and the flight attendant kind of like abrupts, like abruptly wakes me up. It's like, sir, you got to put your seat in the upright position. It's dangerous to the aircraft. Like, are you, please? Are you serious? Like, is it a national security? Like, most of you guys have been on an airplane before. Like, these things aren't lazy boys. Like, you're telling me this is safe and this is not safe. <laughs> this is safe. This is not safe. Uh, uh, I don't know. Okay, so, but what, here's the thing. A big part of the traveling process is when you choose your seats. Okay, so when you book online and you go and pick your seats. Now, you have three seats here, and a lot of us have strategy and preferences on how we choose our seats. Now, I could tell, I could probably guess 100% of the room, you would either choose one of two seats, okay? Number one is the aisle, okay? The aisle is great. You got extra leg room for one leg. You can go to the washroom whenever you want. This is me because I have a tiny bladder, okay? That, that, that is me, this is my preference of choice, the aisle seat. Next is the window seat. Now this is huge amongst the people, because you get a view, you can like lay your head on the wall, you can take pictures of outside and um, you know, give a you know, weird hashtag, and, ooh, mountains, hashtag vibe check, I don't know. But then, but then the middle, the middle's the worst, right? Because you, you're so crammed in, especially if you're stuck between like, you know, two bigger people, and, and, and you're, you don't get the armrest pretty much because it's for these guys or these gals, and, and, and it's just frustrating and annoying. And if you voluntary, um, voluntarily pick the middle seat, I'm just going to say it straight up, you're a psychopath. <laughs> no one intentionally picks the middle seat because it's annoying, it's frustrating, and the whole journey just feels like a waste of time, and you kind of sometimes feel stuck. It's the middle seat. Now, taking this concept about the middle, um, what does it look like in area, uh, any area of your life? Being stuck in the middle. There's this tension when you're stuck in the middle. When you talk about things in life, maybe as a believer, that you have, in a, in a Christian journey, you have like these mighty moments here, and you have these mighty moments here, but for the most part, your life is quite mundane. So how do you navigate life, um, you know, running the tension being between mighty moments and living in a mundane routine. What if, you're, what if you're stuck in this tension where you're not where you used to be, but you're not where you're going to be, and so you're just trying to navigate the complexities of life? Sorry, that's my butt. What about speaking about your faith? How do you manage the tension being in the middle of that when you either have one camp that is, is not willing to listen in or you're just not willing to speak out? Managing attention in the middle can be somewhat frustrating. And maybe you fall into all of these, all of these uh, categories, maybe one or two, but there's usually a fear that comes with it. There's a fear of being stuck. There's a fear of being comfortable. And you know that you know that there's a greater call in your life, but you're not pursuing it. You know it's there. And the one thing that's crippling you, the one thing that's holding you back is a fear. Either a fear of starting, either a fear of effectiveness, or a fear of just being overlooked. You're just kind of in the middle. Maybe you fall into all these categories. One or two of them. I don't know. But no matter who we are in this room, there's a fear that all of us kind of go through that kind of robs us of the journeys of this life. And so this man in the Bible named Jonah, he's tasked with an assignment to go and speak his faith to a place called Nineveh. He has no influence, he has no platform, he has no status. All he needs to do is go speak to him. He's a prophet, and a prophet in those days is someone who has kind of like this radical encounter with God, spends time with him, and then goes and speaks on his behalf to a nation. This is what it says in, in Jonah chapter 1. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, Joppa if you're fancy, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord. So he's a prophet but he's also still a man. He's still a human being. 
There's a fear that kind of paralyzes him. He's in a position where he knows he needs to share his faith, his experience with God, but he has no influence. Last week, Thomas talked about just being in leadership and having a platform and to, to, to say something from there. This is not the case. He needs to speak up, but there's no avenue for him to deliver his message. So, as a matter of fact, the audience doesn't even want to listen to him. So anyone in this room, you know that you should probably do something with your life. Most of you in this room have this faith inside of you, but you're not, you're not doing anything with it. You're not growing it. You're not maturing it. You're not sharing that faith with other people. And all of a sudden right now, you're just kind of collecting dust. But I understand. I understand where you're coming from. I understand that there's this fear that can cripple you. There's a couple of fears we're going to talk about tonight. And the first one is this, is the fear to start. The fear to start. It's hard to start when there are other options to take. Isn't it convenient that as soon as God called this man Jonah to go and speak to a city, there so happens to be another boat going to another direction. Where are you going? Whatever you decide to do that creates meaning and purpose, there will always be an appearance of another option that seems more tempting. Always. There's a fear to start because there's so many options to take. Just in life in general, like, oh, I want to stop gossiping. But then it's like this juicy goss from whoever. Or I want to get healthier. And if someone brings me a donut from Ohana, like, dear Lord. Or I want, I want more patience. But then there's traffic. See, whenever you want to do something that matters, pushback's just around the corner. And just because, and this is the simple truth I kind of want to convey tonight, that just because there are multiple options does not mean that there are multiple ways. Just because there are multiple options does not mean that there are multiple ways. And this person, Jonah, understood that the one way he can live this life is through God himself, how he paves the path, and we need to submit to his plan and his plan alone. Starting can be difficult, especially since we live in a world that kind of glorifies the finished product rather than the work in progress, right? But I do know that God takes the light in the ladder. Take this um, beautiful tree beautiful. Now, for the most part, when you look at plants, when they're fully grown and developed, it kind of like, you know, it kind of lights up the room. It brings like, you know, an accent. I remember when I first moved into my apartment, um, someone helped me decorate. like, you need a plant. I'm like, why? Accent. That's a new word I learned. But when you look at a plant, it's like you're, you're kind of in awe and you're taken back by its beauty. And you see it's like, as it's fully developed, it kind of like, it encaptures you. You're like, oh, wow, this is beautiful. It's amazing. And a lot of people kind of see life that way, that you want to be the finished product, but you, you don't want to get there through the process. That a lot of people are hesitant to actually do the work of, of, of working the soil, of sowing the seeds, or watering its growth. A lot of people want to get to the finished product, but do not want to be in the work in progress. And so when, it, when we share our life with Jesus, about Jesus with other people, it's kind of like that. We want to affect change, we want to affect influence, but we want it to be instant and we want it to be obvious. Let me tell you, that no matter what position you are in, kings, prophets, prostitutes, that your, your influence towards other people and affecting change will never be instant. It will never be obvious. It will take time. And we have to be a part and in, in, in agreeing with the process to put in the work. Everyone thinks like life is just an addition of a couple of massive events or decisions, and then all of a sudden you've arrived. If you want to speak volumes towards people, whether they're listening or not, then you have to get that mindset out and understand that true change does not come with just a few big decisions, but it actually comes with hundreds of smaller ones made consistently. One of the most influential painters in history, Vincent van Gogh, said, great things are done by serious of small things brought together. I've noticed that so many people think a successful life is basically made out of a few big choices. Starting a business, moving to a new city, finishing that degree, inventing this new product line. Big decisions are important, but a true meaningful life doesn't happen through big decisions. It's by building and stacking hundreds of smaller ones. This other prophet named Zechariah in his book, Chapter 4, it says, Do not despite these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices 
to see the work begin. Listen, the one thing that we need to understand tonight is that God will finish it, but we have to start it. You have to start the process. Let God do the things that he's capable of doing, and you do the things that you're capable of doing. So the question to you is, what's the one thing that you need to begin? What's one thing you need to start? And start small. It can be so hard, especially when it's kind of like sharing your life and it's kind of sharing about something you like solely believe in. You, you, believe, it, uh, you believe in it so much, but still when it comes um, to, you know, when the road meets the rubber, it's so hard to actually deliver that. I understand. I've been there. You're probably thinking, oh, Ruben, like, ah, you're such a, such a cool, suave, you know, guy speaking so well up here. No, I was the most awkwardest teenager in high school ever. Like, I couldn't talk to a girl. Like, I, I remember in grade 11, I had this one crush, uh, crush, not crush, crush <laughs> on, on this girl named, uh, on this girl, Lizzie. She was blonde hair. She played volleyball. She had a nose ring. She had sweatpants. It said spike on the butt. My mom wouldn't approve. And and I, I wanted to work up the nerve to go talk to her and stuff like that. And when I finally did, I went on a double date with her and two other people. And you know the first words that came out of my mouth? Hey, Lizzie, do you like toast? Like, <laughs> thought there was no hope for me. Do you need to grow somewhere? Start somewhere uh, to grow as a leader? Maybe you need to start uh, learning from a mentor. Or begin praying daily about your need or start to read an article a week about the thing that you want to get better at. Maybe it's your finances. You need to get your finances under control. Maybe you're sick of swimming in debt, tired of worrying about money. Maybe you need to take a class or something to get yourself out of it so you can start giving um, rather than keep on getting. Maybe you just need to be closer with Jesus. Maybe, maybe some of us in this room need to actually step out and speak out in faith, but the only way to do that is when we actually get to know Jesus for himself, to actually grow our faith for ourselves. And I, I say this to my, my, my younger students all the time, but like my hope for you is that you wouldn't base God off of someone else's experience. Like, oh, God is so good. Look what he did in my mom's life. Like, no, we believe here at the Project in Hope City Church that that God loves you and you individually and wants to grow your own faith and mature your life and your journey. I'm going to ask Pastor Amanda. Can you come up and join me up here for a sec? Can you give it up for Pastor Amanda, everyone? So, Amanda works here. And I chose her for a specific reason. I was going to choose a random volunteer, but I I just know, like, based on my luck, someone's going to ruin my illustration. So, I'm just just going to, yeah. Um, is your mic on? Good. So, so, base, so I, have this, um, I have this donut here from Ohana. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. It's the best donut in town, in my opinion. Okay, in I, your opinion. In my opinion, I think it's the best donut in town. Okay. okay. Now, did you know that Ohana is Edmonton-based? No, I yeah. didn't. It's, it's, it's strictly in the YEG area. Um, did you know Ohana? I don't know what it means actually, but um, did you know that it started in? Um, I think they know. They're also yeah. Talking. <laughs> it means something. People are thinking oh, family. It's family. That makes sense. I thought. I, I don't. Think I, sure. I think I saw it in a movie. Lila How are we going to disagree with them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I have the mic. So, um, so Ohana started uh, as a food truck. Actually, did you know that? Back, at, back in 2017? I think we brought them as a food truck this summer, but I didn't eat oh, them. okay. I think we had them this well, summer. Well, it originally started as a food truck, and then they had their first storefront, and it started opening on Canada Day in 2017. Do you know that? No. Do you know that when, when, you, when you eat this donut, that this beautiful donut went through six different processes to get it baked? Is that for real? For reals. Okay. I, don't, I don't know what the process looks like, but apparently on the website, it's six. Six, okay, six steps, I believe Six you. steps yeah. to making this donut. Okay. Okay? Do you believe me that this is the best donut in town? I'm getting there. You getting there? Yeah. Okay. So how about this? Instead of me just talking about it. Do I get to eat it? Yes. I do? Let's eat it together. Take it. Can I, have, can I put my gum out? <laughs> yeah, that's gross. But... This is weird. Like, do I face that? Oh. Everyone's watching you eat right now. <laughs> okay. I can taste you should each be. six steps. <laughs> <laughs> you can taste each six steps. Okay, awesome. Good? Thank you so much. You can give her a round of applause, okay, everyone. that's weird. Now, kind of awkward talking with my mouth full now. Listen, when I was describing the donut to um, Amanda, 
I was kind of like spitting facts about it. And it's like, this is what the process looks like. Ohana is whatever it means, family. And, and I'm, I'm kind of talking about the donut, right? And, but but, but in, in essence, like if I were to talk to someone on the street about this, they necessarily wouldn't be convinced that it's the best donut in town unless they took a bite out of it. Like, don't just spit the facts about the donut. Just taste it for yourself. And, and, and you make that judgment for yourself. A lot of us, when it comes to sharing our faith about Jesus— is that we can, we can spit facts about Jesus, use this persuasive vocabulary, and, and talk around Jesus. But we need to be more like a man named David in the Bible who says, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus personally. And a lot of us are trying to share our faith, but we're sharing our faith knowing about Jesus, not knowing him intimately and personally. Some of us in this room need to start owning our faith. A lot of, a lot of us in this room are young adults. We need to start maturing our faith, creating a faith for ourselves, not riding the coattails of our friends or our family. So there's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Where else do you need to start? Where where do you need to begin? Start small, but start with something. Because the decisions you make today, as this pastor says this, the decisions you make today will affect the stories you tell tomorrow. God will finish it, but you have to start it. So there's this fear of starting, but there's also this fear of effectiveness. Does this even matter? Do I even matter? I know this is, this is a simple truth, but I think a lot of us in this room need to be reminded that everyone has a role in God's plan. Everyone has a role in God's plan. God is ultimately in control, but no matter where you're coming from, whatever background or walks of life you are in, you have a role. All of us, that, that there's an aspect in our lives that we get to share our faith, whether it's from the stage or behind the scenes or one-on-one with a person from a coffee shop. In 1995, 1996, there's a basketball team called the Chicago Bulls who um, had the highest record until it was broken just a few years ago. But it's still debated in sports history that this was the best team to step on the court. In 1996, when they won the championship, um, an interviewer asked uh, a specific person on the team a question. Now, when you look at this team, you can only, for most of us in the sports world and maybe even beyond, knows about a couple of spotlight players and superstars on the team. Superstars are, we all know, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. And so when he won the championship in 96, someone asked uh, Scottie Pippen a question. He, says, uh, he asked him, what are your keys to your success for this year? He said two simple things. Number one, everyone knew that they were going to win before they stepped onto the court. Everyone had a winning mentality. But the second thing kind of struck me. He said, everyone knew their role before they laced up their shoes. Everyone knew their role before they laced up their shoes. So even though Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen were kind of the superstars or the spotlight players, they could not have won that championship if it wasn't for the other three, Ron Harper, Luke Longley, and Dennis Rodman. If one person didn't perform, then the whole team got affected. So just like our lives and living our lives amongst other Jesus followers, everyone has a part to play in order to get the win. When you live amongst people where you may not have that direct influence, well then, you have indirect influence. And it's how you choose to use it to make that difference. God has given you everything you need to accomplish the call that God has called you to. What does it look like? Our heart, the project, is very simple, but it is, it is passionate, and it is weighing, and it is for people. And we know there's 150,000 young adults in Edmonton alone, and that they not only need to hear about the greatest love story ever told, but I believe they deserve to hear it. And we have a part to play. The project staff people is only four people. Do you know what's more effective than four people sharing their faith? 400 people sharing their faith. That's a lot more effective. That's a huge difference. Now, I can't just say like, oh, like I'm just a teacher. I'm like, no, you're not just a teacher. You're, you're actually God's representative in the classroom so people will see what does Jesus look like when he's teaching math. Like, oh, I'm just a nurse. Like, you're not just a nurse. You are God's representative in the medical field so people will see what does Jesus look like when he's given a flu shot. Oh, I'm just a Starbucks barista. Like, you're not a barista. You're God's representative in the coffee shop. So what do people think what Jesus looks like when he's making a frappuccino? Wherever you are, you are God's representative of him. And you don't have to make it weird. Like, just please don't make it weird. Anyone have, like, a weird Christian friend in their friend group? I don't know if you have one. 
Yeah. If you don't have one, you're probably it. <laughs> See, the biggest, the biggest impact that you can make on people are not just the words you say, but the actions that you do, how you live your life. It says this in John 13, 35, that your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Is it possible that it can actually be that easy? Is it possible that people can actually get a glimpse of Jesus based on how we interact with one another? Could it be so? Lastly, the fear that holds us back is the fear of being overlooked. Hate to burst your bubble, but when you die, your name will probably not go down in textbooks. Your funeral may not be televised. But I do know this, is that everyone in the kingdom of God, anyone in God's plan who says yes to him, and what God is asking us to do is reciprocated unto other people. There's a story of this radical encounter of a, of a guy meeting God. This man later ends up writing 13, possibly 14 books of the entire New Testament. This is what the Bible says in Acts chapter 9. So the Lord spoke to him in a vision to this man named Ananias. And he says, yes, Lord. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street. It was pretty creative back then. To the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man named Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming to him and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to everyone. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead, um, instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Everyone knows about Saul. Not a lot of people know about Ananias. Look at this man named Peter, who is considered one of the most, most popular disciples of Jesus. This is one of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, his brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall now be called Peter. Everyone knows about Peter, but not a lot of people know about Andrew. Has anyone heard about a man named Billy Graham? He's pretty popular. <laughs> I assume so. He's considered as America's pastor, famous, pivotal person in, in the Christian movement in North America. Preached to over 215 million people in 150 countries. He passed just um, last year. But his name amongst believers and non-believers till this day still lives on. Incredible person. A lot, a lot of us in this room know him. Has anyone ever heard of Charles Templeton? I assume not a lot of you. Charles Templeton was a small town pastor at the small church who actually led Billy Graham to Jesus. See, this man named Saul was later called Paul who became famous even today. Believers and non-believers know about the work that he's done. He gets this massive spotlight in the Bible. I'm so thankful for Paul because without him, we wouldn't have these rich books from the Bibles like Romans and Philippians and so on and so forth. But I'm also thankful for Ananias. This one person who said yes to God to go effect change to one person, which actually trickled down events that changed human history as we know it. I'm thankful for Peter. He's a bold disciple who in the book of Acts started preaching this message and 3,000 people got saved. But I'm also thankful for Andrew. Someone who spotted him and took a leap of faith and introduced Jesus to Peter in the first place. I'm thankful for Billy Graham. My parents were introduced to Jesus personally through him and it affected me personally. But I'm also thankful for Charles Templeton, who was obedient to lead someone towards Jesus. Names won't last forever, but the impact will be. So how would you live your faith in this life, even when people don't want to listen to you? Listen, you have no idea how one moment of kindness and love can impact someone else's life. In the Bible, it talks about sowing seeds. In 1 Corinthians, it says this, like I planted the seeds in your heart. This is Paul writing. 
and his friend Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important to know is that God makes the seed grow. Quick little story. I've been here for two and a half years now in Edmonton. Before that, uh, I was a youth pastor in Kamloops, British Columbia. I lived there for four years. In the last few months of my time there, I, um, I decided to get this tattoo. I have a tattoo right here. It's a half sleeve, and it's kind of like this, uh, like a biblical map. It has some stuff on it, and it says Acts 8, 1, 8 on it. Like, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And it has like, these world coordinates of where I accepted Jesus. And it's pretty sentimental and personal to me, but what I wanted it, why I wanted it was to have a conversation started with other people, just to, just to get something going. And so I got my tattoo done in Kamloops, and this person who was doing it, he sat down, and he was kind of working on it. It took four hours, so we had some time to chat. And he looks at it, and he says, hey, this is a pretty, like, interesting design. Like, what, uh, how'd you come up with it? What, uh, what does it mean to you? So I started talking about it and the meaning behind it and started sharing about my life and just started talking about Jesus. And by the end of the sessions, I said, hey, man, like, you don't have to, but, like, we had this church just down the road. I'd uh, love for you to come check it out. Long and behold, that very same Sunday, him and his girlfriend came to our church service. And it was funny because, like, he's this guy just full of tattoos, and he walks in, and like, all these old ladies just around him and, like, hugging him and stuff like that. It was, it was kind of cool. And then a couple of weeks later, I had to make my move towards Edmonton. I didn't know anything about it. All I did was just gave him an invitation to come to church. About six months ago, I had a FaceTime with a friend back from Kamloops, and he told me, he's like, hey, man, remember that tattoo artist that, like, you just randomly brought to church? He's like, yeah, what about him? He's like, oh, like, he actually accepted Jesus, and his girlfriend accepted Jesus, and right now, as he, we speak, he's in Peru just doing missions work. And I was like, what? That's insane. Like, I, I thought to myself, like, one moment of conversation, just one invitation led to these events of other people in that church speaking light towards him, showing kindness towards him, and overall just painting a picture of Jesus towards him. You never know how one moment can change someone's life. Your job may not to be flip someone upside down. Maybe your job this coming week is to buy someone lunch. Maybe it's just to help someone's grandmother move houses. Maybe it's to say something, but something small. No matter what, your job isn't to make the plant grow. That's God's job. So no matter where you are, there's a place where we can all start. Maybe for you tonight, it's just to make the project a regular part of your week. Maybe it's seeing or talking to someone. Maybe it's reading something. But as we close tonight, I'd love to pray for you. As we close tonight, as you leave this building, there's just one question I want to ask you, and it's this. What's one thing you can start today that tomorrow will thank you for? Life isn't, isn't made just on like big decisions and big decisions. It's made by a bunch of smaller ones. So what can you do today that tomorrow will thank you for? I'd love to pray for you, and uh, we're good to go. I know a lot of you guys have exams, so I'm going to pray for you as well because Lord knows you need it. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the project. Thank you for this gathering. And thank you that people from all walks of life are welcome here and belong here. And I know your love, God, is, is, is available to all. We all have access to you. So Jesus, I pray for every single person here. I pray for those specifically right now that are um, just in university or post-secondary, just doing some work. And this is a very busy time, an overwhelming season for us. So I pray that you just calm nerves and just bring peace, that you bring energy into their studying. And we just pray for those who just can't make it tonight. God, I pray for our moments of learning, and I pray, God, you would start to instill something in our hearts, this new burden, this, 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 little, this little nudging of starting something new, whether it's big or small. God, I pray you would reveal to us what the first step may look like. So, God, as we kind of continue our Christmas season, for a lot of us, it's a joyous moment, but for a lot of us, can, it could possibly bring grief and brokenness and heartache. So I pray for both camps of people, those who are just kind of living the mountaintops, that they would enjoy and savor their time, but those who are kind of living in a rut and living in a valley moment, I pray you make yourself so available and, and your tangible presence will be beside them. So overall, I just pray for everyone in this room, pray for an amazing rest of the week, and looking forward to what the project holds in the next uh, few months. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, have a great rest of the week. Good luck on exams if you're doing it. We'll see you next Sunday.